Hi, I'm Mike Hawk, founder of Mini Kudos Inc. And today we're excited to finally announce the launch of our first product. Introducing Objects. Obj objects. It's a... Oh, piss, what is it actually doing? Look, the packaging's nice and it's got Bluetooth. And um, we made an app that does... Uh, look, I'll be honest. I'm a bit in over my head here. I'm running out of ideas on how to fit in with San Francisco's startup legends. I've already converted to double veganism and stopped wearing shoes in order to ground myself. Perhaps a look at what not to do will give me the answers that I need. Ever since the first angel investor mistook undiagnosed ADHD as auteur brilliance, Silicon Valley startups have thrived. Starry-eyed, lanyard-collecting entrepreneurs who dropped out of CompSci after two years because they heard that Bill Gates was a dropout as well, flocked to Silicon Valley in the hopes of becoming the next Steve Jobs minus the cancer. These workplace harassment cases in the making have a hard road ahead of them. And as we'll find today, it takes more than just a snappy name and a slick UI to trick investors into giving you hundreds of millions of dollars. Actually, no, wait, that's literally all it takes. It's time to dive into the gratuitously over-designed and delightfully awful world of tech startups, their stupid smart products, and what I believe to be the worst product of them all. Let's kick this list off with Raid Shadow Legends. Now, I'm sure many of you people have heard of this one and... Wait, we're getting sponsored by them. Raid Shadow Legends is a real video game available right now on your phone. It can be in here for free. How do they manage to get it in there? Your phone is such a small, stupid cube. So how do they fit over 500 freaking epic champions in there? I hope they have plenty to eat and drink. Not to mention the massive story campaign, raid bosses, dungeons, PvP arena matches and encouraging messages from your dad? Last month I finally decided to check out what the whole Raid Shadow Legends thing is that everyone's always going on about. And to my surprise it was, well, let's just say they should start renaming it to Rad Shadow Legends. S start calling it, start calling it Rad. Look, I'm a sucker for a good fantasy RPG and tweaking my team comps to counter a difficult mission is like a puzzle but better because this one has bodacious babes and dragons in it. Am I right, fellas? Check out these two, for example. Creela Witch Arm. She's a witch, she's got an arm. Pretty straightforward stuff, right? She's a support champion with a special ability to attack with your entire team of weights. Combine it with heroes like Battle Sage, an epic champion with a powerful AoE attack, who also wants to speak to the manager, and you'll be turning your enemies into beef stew in no time. Now, if you're watching my channel, you're clearly a gamer of the highest caliber, and as such, are terrified of showering and running out of content. Don't worry, Raid has you covered. Well, for the content. This month alone, they've added 11 new champions, 200 new missions, with an exclusive legendary champion if you complete them all, and five brand new stages to almost every dungeon in the game. So what are you waiting for? Go to the video description, click the links, and support my channel by contracting raids today. Rapper turned tech guru Will I Am has tried time and time again to break into the ever lucrative tech startup bubble. Will's tech career had an incredibly strong start, making a fat sack of loot as the third equity partner for Beats Electronics, creators of Beats by Dre headphones and the lesser known Beat by Dr. Dre and Deets by Dr. Dre. William has done everything from garish iPhone accessories to ruining cars, but nothing exemplifies just how much San Francisco Kool-Aid he's slung back than his foray into wearable technology. The Pulse, a wearable watch? Well, it's not a watch. Um, it's a device on your wrist called the Pulse. Um, it's not a watch because watches don't have SIM cards. My bad, do not call it a watch. The watch, in addition to looking like some futuristic handcuffs, felt like them as well. They were notably stiff and uncomfortable, even if you had tiny manlet wrists. People with larger wrists could add a little module to increase the width, ensuring an even wider pool of people could discover just how awful they are. The screen was tiny, even for 2014, and meant that typing a single letter was a slow, sticky process that required you to hold your finger down to select a single letter. 
giving you plenty of time to rethink your life decisions. The unique selling point of the Pulse, besides a secret Santa gift for someone that you hate, was its ability to determine your mood by analysing your speech. In Will's fantasy hellscape where everyone somehow adopts the Pulse, you could follow people's moods and check up on them if they were feeling down or ignore people who called you with bad vibes. Um, and more importantly, say for example you're working and someone calls you with a bad vibe, why do you want to answer a bad vibe call? So you're just gonna like deny it right away? Is yeah. that what you would do? You don't like the bad vibes? I mean, not if I'm in a good vibe and I'm working <laughs> trying to focus and somebody's calling me on a red alert. Thankfully, nobody adopted the Pulse because nobody wants to spend $400 on a watch that'll update your mum every time you're cranking out a Wango smoothie. Oh. Somehow, Willie is didn't learn his lesson and went on to create The Dial, a smartwatch that instead opted to use voice activation for most of its commands. The dial was powered by Will's proprietary Siri knockoff, Anita, a mixture of the name Anita and I need a, as in, I need you to just focus on music, Will. Whoa. While voice commands aren't anything new, the dial sold itself as something that you would have a conversation with instead of just barking commands at, something that Will exemplifies wonderfully. Let's have a conversation. Let's talk about music. What do you feel like eating? I feel like eating sushi. Oh. It was supposedly launched on UK Telecom Service 3 with a flashy launch party sporting more celebrities than a registered sex offender list. But outside of this one mostly positive independent review, it appears to be scrubbed from the internet completely. Seriously, there are almost no reviews or any real mention of it from after its release date. Suspiciously so. Despite the one positive review I did find of it, the dial clearly didn't set the UK or the world on fire and the remaining dials were most likely buried in a New Mexico landfill site. Will has more or less behaved himself since then, his company IM Plus instead acquiring already proven technology instead of attempting to create their own. He recently partnered up to create a smart mask which admittedly does look pretty sick, except that it costs $300 in a time of unprecedented unemployment. So never mind. Ah yes, secrets. The world's spiciest words. Well, besides that one. One of the greatest features of the internet is its ability to grant anonymity to any one of its users. No more are you dipshit Dan, general loser and guy who pissed himself during class when he was nine, but Hot Rocks 92 Reddit mod, owner of a successful meme page on Facebook, and the guy who pissed himself in class when he was nine. We didn't forget Dan. Those with a guilty conscience or a general desire to overshare could now do so freely without the fear of repercussions. And it wasn't long before app developers found a social void that Facebook could never fill. Okay, how about this? We make an app where you can share anonymous messages, but get this, they're only shared amongst people within your contacts. That'll make the messages shared even more salacious, knowing that it might just be your friend Jeff admitting to the world that he's never been sure if he's wiping properly or not. This was the idea behind social media app Secret. Unsurprisingly however, secrets are usually secrets for a reason, and while throwing one out into the ether of the internet to get it off your chest is one thing, sharing it amongst the circle of people who may very well be affected by it is another thing entirely. Well, assuming the app was used for secrets at all, there really was nothing stopping you from just posting hateful messages towards someone who you know is more or less guaranteed to see it without ever having to reveal your identity. In 16 short months, Secret exploded, gained millions of dollars in investor funding, was valued at around $100 million, and then flopped. Users rapidly decreased, in part due to the rampant bullying on the app, and Secret shut down in April of 2015. Okay, so the whole context thing was uh, maybe a bit too close for comfort. What if we just restrict the anonymous messages by location instead? This idea fueled Yik Yak, turning it into a sort of anonymous virtual message board, much like the one in Animal Crossing that you use to call Tom Nook a pedophile. Of course, for all the positive or at least entertaining uses it had, the cyberbully potential was off the charts. 
Between this and at least three instances of anonymous bomb threats, schools constantly struggled with Yik Yak until they added in the functionality that disabled the use of the app on all middle and high school grounds across the USA. Even on university campuses, where the app wasn't banned, there were widespread reports of hate speech. Although, as Slate pointed out, anonymity also gave marginalized people the ability to speak their mind without repercussions. The extensive cyberbullying, whether real or perpetuated by the media, resulted in a severe decline in Yik Yak's user base, and the company shut down in 2017. Okay, 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 okay. So, maybe anonymizing people who are free to post anything they want about people who have a good chance of seeing it isn't the best idea. What if we just take all the secrets in the world and, and just push them into a big hole? Whisper does exactly that, and their lack of geographical or personal ties makes it incredibly difficult to cyberbully individuals. In addition to their pledge to heavily moderate any potential cyberbullying or hate posts. As a result, it's still kicking today, nine years after its release. Let's take a peek and see what kind of secrets everyone was so desperate to share. Ah yes, I can see why these secret sharing apps were worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Tech startup product names are notoriously cringe. They usually involve taking either a synonym or onomatopoeia related to the product and dropping a letter or replacing a vowel with a Y. But sometimes it isn't the bespeckled cuckold in charge who makes the awful naming decision. Sometimes a name that seemed reasonable at the time can be dealt a cruel twist of fate by the universe. In 2015, Google acquired assets and IP from the company behind Digital Wallet Softcard in order to help their Android devices better compete with Apple Pay. The name Softcard already conjures imagery of a card that, I swear, isn't usually like this, until you hear the original name. Isis Mobile Wallet. Isis Mobile Wallet was a joint partnership between T-Mobile, Verizon, and AT&T. That was first announced in 2010, but in 2014 was forced to change their name due to the uncomfortable comparison to the terrorist organization of the same name. Okay, so this next one isn't technically some kind of flashy dot-com startup, but uh, well, just you'll see. So while the ISIS mobile wallet was obviously very poorly named, it surprisingly had no relation to the terrorist organization. Meanwhile, until the 90s, there was an appetite suppressant named Question, why take diet pills when you can enjoy AIDS? AIDS helps you lose weight without making you jittery. The AIDS appetite suppressant had been around since the 1940s, but the HIV AIDS epidemic of the 1980s, coupled with the fact that the disease also caused weight loss, resulted in an even more significant weight loss of the product sales. One executive was quoted saying, the product has been around for 45 years. Let the disease change its name. A sentiment I'm sure Corona Beer would agree with. By the late 80s, AIDS attempted a rebrand. While any sane person would cut their losses, cast the name AIDS into the fire, and name it something like, I don't know, SARS instead, their marketing geniuses instead decided to name it Diet AIDS. The product didn't make it past the early 90s. Okay, I know this probably sounds like the tamest topic in this video, but I assure you, anything even tangentially related to technology and beverages is 100% guaranteed to be a failure in the making. Let's start with Vessel. Vessel was... <sighs> Okay, fuck, look, that, that name is exactly the kind of awful bullshit I was talking about earlier. Just name it Big Wet or something instead. Vessel was an intelligent drinking glass that could allegedly sense what fluid you had poured into it and output nutritional information about it to a display on the side and to an app. I'm not entirely sure what the use case is where you need to verify what the beverage you just poured into the cup was, unless you're like a 1400s nobleman afraid of ingesting poison. Outputting nutritional information to your phone is slightly more useful, but they also just have that on the label, you dumpling. Not to mention, if you want to use this for your daily routine of coffee, soda, beer, and pig blood, 
you're gonna have to constantly wash this thing out, lest you find yourself with some unholy concoction of beverages. Oh, yep, that's beer, all right. After securing over a million dollars in pre-orders, the team behind Vessel found out that chemistry is actually pretty difficult uh, and that the product might not even be doable. Something you'd probably want to nail down before you, you know, had thousands of paying customers. <laughs> they then delayed it multiple times, released a more feasible product that instead just tracks how much water you drink a day and slowly slipped away into the sunset, hoping all the people who had funded them wouldn't demand their money back. Except that they did, and most refund requests were ignored. Whoa! Finally, we're at the last entry to this list. To me, this is the most egregious example in this entire list, and was the inspiration for this whole video. Sure, they didn't scam as much money as Theranos, or failed to deliver their product like the vessel, but if you want an example for creating a solution to a problem you created, over designing it and then slapping on an app for some reason, look no further than the Juicero. Juicero was a cold pressed juice machine for your home that initially retailed for 700 fucking fat beans. Almost as ridiculous as the fact that they were able to secure over $120 million from big names like Google. It was very slickly designed and would squeeze five to eight dollar bags of fresh chopped fruits and veggies with several tons of force. Because the big draw was the freshness of the produce, they only had a shelf life of around eight days and were printed with a QR code that was scanned by the Juicero to check whether or not it was past its expiration date. Good luck putting your balls in there as well for a bit of CBT action because it also scanned to make sure that there was authentic Juicero bags in there. Anything else and it ain't squishy. You would think, while pricey, I mean this might not be the worst product in the world, right? until it was discovered that you could simply squeeze the juice packets with your hands or even just placing a small dog on top of them, as an infamous Bloomberg video demonstrated. Of course, it's not like you just nip down to the store, buy a few bags and squeeze them at your leisure. Juicero refused to ship their juice bags to anyone who didn't purchase their $700 paperweight and, as mentioned before, would scan a QR code on it to make sure you didn't have the audacity to go out and buy knockoff bags for cheap. It also has to be connected to Wi-Fi, because fuck you, and also has an app that tells you about the health benefits of a specific juice. Helpful! And also tells you where they source the specific produce from. Unhelpful, plus who gives a shit. Juicero imploded after people realised it was dumb as fuck, and because they struggled to iron out the supply issues around sourcing fresh, raw fruits and vegetables on a wide scale consistently. And also because it was dumb as fuck. So, there you have it. If there's one thing I've learned from studying the veritable wankery of these startup projects, it's that, above all, you must strive to have a sudden and unsatisfying conclusion to your story. What's fucking gamers? Just letting you know that me and three of my best boys have started a weekly comedy podcast named Beef Boys. Here's a brief sample. Be sure to click the annotation to see more.